achieved. Welcome back to Kamikaze Overdrive MMA Predictions. As always, I am your host, Scott Johnson. And on this episode of the show, I'm breaking down the upcoming UFC Fight Night 62 event, which will take place in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, and feature Damian Maia taking on Ryan LaFlair in the main event of the evening. Now, this is the second time I'm recording the show because I just recorded the entire show, start to finish, and unfortunately, for some reason, my microphone was not working despite the fact that levels were showing up. It recorded uh, nothing. So I'm doing it all again. If I sound a little bit rushed, I apologize. I just uh, invested a ton of time and got absolutely nothing in return. Uh, I will be, as always, giving all my preliminary breakdowns at kamikazeoverdrive.net, so please head over to that uh, website and check out all of them. Also, the bet packs will be available. I'm actually coming up the first show. I want a little bit of cash, but uh, it was a negative return for the first time in a little while. So certainly going to get back on top of the bet pack winnings and the DraftKings competition. Please, if you're interested in competing in fantasy MMA, it is an absolute fantastic thing. I was a little bit on the fence at first, but I've played in the last two competitions that my website has hosted through DraftKings, and it has been fantastic. It's 10 bucks for my tournament or and there's a plethora of tournaments ranging from free to you can spend a ton of money and uh it's you pick five fighters you get a, you create a roster of fighters they get points based on significant strikes uh top position control obviously winning the fight gets you points depending on how quickly you're able to finish it uh the website gives you all the information there and in my case you can spend 10 bucks it's winner take all 20 competitors first person for, person who finishes first gets 180 bucks to take home and it's uh, pretty darn exciting. And actually, the last two shows, have uh, both competitions have been taken. The winner has, has gone to a member of my website with uh, Mitchell Davies winning the first show, 180 bucks. The last competition winner was Brent uh, Pierce, who took home a uh, cool $225. I'll be cutting my show back to just 20, or competition back to just 20 competitors for this event because it is a smaller event. But uh, certainly looking forward to competing again. I finished 24th of 25 competitors last time, so I kind of shit the bed to say uh, things as bluntly as possible. And I look to get back on top. I did go 9 and 20 in the first event. Uh, either way, I implore you to come out and take it, take on the challenge. Click on any one of the banners and follow the instructions, and you should have no problem. It's pretty cool live scoring, all that fun stuff. I can't plug it enough. It's certainly a lot of fun. Uh, that's enough for me as far as rambling. Let's get to my first prediction of the evening. Our opening prediction takes place in the UFC's featherweight division. It's got Fredo Pepe, 12-3-0, takes on Andre Touchy Feely with a current record of 14 wins and 2 losses. Now, Pepe's coming off back-to-back -back highlight reel victories, a flying knee knockout, and then a first round submission in his last fight. He did start his octagon run at one and three, but it's certainly right at the ship as of right now. For Andre Feely, he's one and two or two and one inside the octagon. He rebounded with a win over Felipe Arantes in his last appearance. Uh, which was uh, preceded by a submission loss to Max Holloway. Now, for Feely, this is back-to-back -back fights fighting in Brazil, and he could beat a pretty good Brazilian by decision at home, which is very difficult to do. And that's going to give him a lot of confidence, also considering, and it's not MMA math, it's just, you know, that psychological edge. Felipe Aranta is the man he just defeated, took out and uh, defeated uh, Pepe via first-round TKO back in mid-2013, so certainly a psychological edge to the American. Now, it is tough fighting in Brazil, but I think the experience of being successful is going to be massive. Also, coming from Alpha Male, who has a ton of experience fighting in Brazil and against Brazilians, will give this kid you know, some certain edges that other fighters aren't privy to. Physically, Feely will be four inches taller, number one inch reach advantage. Looking at their win uh, records, Feely, seven wins by knockout, three wins by submission, and four decisions. Uh, Pepe, a little bit opposite, seven wins by submission, three wins by knockout, and he's one-on-one one with fights go the distance. He also has been knocked out twice. Uh, the Brazilian is a BJJ black belt. His wrestling numbers, though, not so great. 0.35 takedowns and 11% completion rate, 46% takedown defense. He relies heavily on his opponents to try and take the fight to the mat and then looks to orchestrate sweeps or attack for submissions off his back. He really likes that Oompa sweep, uh, attack with the Kimura, get his opponent defending that, and then sweep sometimes into top position, or sometimes in a full mount when he goes to top position. And, you know, he will pull guard in search of that. It did cost him against Felipe Arantes and Sam Cecilia, who both knocked him out from top position. I could see, I expect to see him doing that again in this fight. For Andre Feely, 3.91 takedowns a 42% completion rate, 42% defensive uh, takedown defense as well. He landed five takedowns against Arantes, three against Max Holloway. It was very difficult to take off his feet, and he comes from a very good wrestling-oriented camp. Big question is, can Pepe take him down? I doubt it. More importantly, you know, will Feely use his wrestling offensively or defensively, and can he stifle anything that uh, uh, Pepe attempts off his back? For Godofredo, pulling guard, I don't recommend against a guy who's bigger than him, has a pretty strong wrestling base, and can generate a lot of power from top position. On the feet, Pepe, a negative striking exchange, about half a strike per minute. He's very loose defensively, back straight up, he leaves his chin up in the air, and it's certainly question marks against a guy who, you know, has been tagged and knocked out a couple of times. He's incredibly aggressive, which probably is 
a good thing considering his lack in technical efficient or you know technical offense. He overextends at times though, but that jumping knee he landed against Nahod Lahat was incredibly impressive. Uh, for Feely, a pretty solid striking technique and it always improving. He sits down on his strikes very nice, has good power, excellent volume of just over four strikes per minute, limits his opponent's 61% striking defense, which is very solid. Uh, he was holding his own against a very talented Max Holloway. He did slow down a bit, but he took some body shots in that matchup. For Pepe, all three of his victories in the UFC have ended inside the first round. After that, he's 1-1 one one with a very questionable split decision win in that one victory. For Feely, he's 92 in fights that last longer than the first round. One of those losses coming by injury in the fifth round early in his career and the other one to Max Holloway. The experience of winning in Brazil is massive for a young fighter. He knows what to expect. The heat factor could be an issue. We always talk about that in Brazil and how it could play a role. I think that would actually affect Pepe more because he's more aggressive and tends to you know slow down a little bit in fights. Uh, the Brazil decision is a possibility there if uh, he's aggressive and they look at that as being the better fighter quote unquote uh feely has to be very careful especially early on especially even if he gets on top he has to mind his p's and q's and avoid giving up position even when he gets you know a dominant position uh but i think as the fight progresses he pulls away and possibly checks pepe's chin once or twice and my prediction is andre feely the defeat got afredo pepe by knockout Moving right along, we go to the UFC's lightweight division as Gilbert Burns, undefeated at 9 0, takes on the debuting Alex Oliveira with a current record of 10 wins, 1 loss. I believe he might have a draw and a no contest in there as well. Uh, the UFC has his record wrong on their website. Oliveira is debuting both in a new promotion and in a new weight class as he formerly fought as a welterweight, now cutting down 15 pounds to the lightweight division. Uh, for Burns, he debuted as a welterweight. He said cutting the lightweight where he had fought most of his career you know, prior to coming to the UFC was difficult for him, but he did have a successful cut in his second appearance and got the job done. For Oliveira, he's a fairly strong striker, and in some of the reports I have read, he draws some comparisons or loose, loose comparisons to Anderson Silva and the way he deploys his Muay Thai attack. He has a decent striking game, works the collar tie effectively, likes to unload unload with a barrage of punches, highlighted by some uppercuts from that position. Eight of his ten wins have come by knockout. He is he did recently pick up his first win by submission, uh, and his only loss came to current UFC welterweight Wendell Oliveira. He does have nine first-round victories, and he's 2-1-1 one, one after the first round. And I'm going to highlight this a lot throughout this entire prediction card, simply because with the heat and the factors, cardio for even guys that usually don't have issues can be a factor. Uh, he has serviceable wrestling with decent takedowns, but not a ton of submission success, as previously mentioned. He can get a little bit of wild when he's engaging, and he will leave himself open to being attacked uh, and countered when he does so. For for Gilbert Burns, he's an accomplished and highly accredited BJJ black belt. Five wins by submission, three of them by armbar, two of them by rear naked chokes. You really know what you're getting with him. He took, in his last fight, he took his opponent down, advanced position very quickly, you know, tight top control. As soon as his opponent moved and tried to defend, he, you know, rotated the back position, and then bang, locked on that armbar for the victory. He showed, you know, in his debut, he showed, you know, pretty workable striking. He does have three wins by knockout, so he's not just a grappler. That's a solid thing to have on your repertoire. He can strike both at range and in close, do some damage in the clinch position, and then from there change levels for a takedown if necessary. Uh, he certainly is going to be stronger on the floor than his opponent, but his striking offense is a nice alternative to have to fall back on. I anticipate still he's going to want to take this fight where the greatest talent gap lies and take his opponent out of his comfort zone, and that is to score takedowns and work a submission game. Oliveira has a decent sprawl, but I think you know his striking is going to be slightly stunted or fear being taken down. And when you look at that sprawl, we did see Joanna Janjacek have a ton of success capturing the women's... Uh, Oh, I was going to say flyweight title, but strawweight title, my apologies, using the sprawl to keep Carlos Sparza from getting top position. The thing is, though, with a guy like Gilbert Burns, who's very crafty, you'll see him cut some angles, change the direction, and make adjustments, and eventually grab on an opponent and work a position that's work himself in a position that's going to be you know positive and get on top, even if you try to sprawl out of it, unless you disengage immediately and get out of there. Uh, if you know, Oliveira can connect. He could change the complexion of this fight, but he's very wild and he's off balance at times. That doesn't bode well for a fighter who's looking to take you down. Burns has yet to taste defeat and has only been outside of the first round once, which happened in his UFC debut. And, you know, if this weight cut doesn't go well and he gets out of the first round, we could see some issues there. Uh, but debuting for a fighter is tough. Debuting in a new weight class is tough. Having to deal with smaller guys who might be more technically sound than you're used to dealing with is all very difficult. And my prediction is Gilbert Burns and defeat Alex Oliveira. I'll take the grappler by submission. Burns by submission, for clarity's sake. Bout number three on the main card takes place in the UFC's women's bantamweight division as the number ninth ranked Amanda the Lioness Nunez 9-4-0 battles the queen of spades and longtime UFC or sorry longtime women's MMA veteran Shayna Baszler with a current record of 15 wins and nine 
losses. Now, both girls are coming off losses against upper-level competition. For Nunes, this will be her fourth fight in the UFC. For Baszler, this is her second opportunity. Experience advantage, certainly to the Queen of Spades with a 24-13 edge overall. Physically, though, Amanda Nunes, one inch taller and held a two-inch reach advantage. Now, both girls are BJJ brown belts. Nunes throws in a judo brown belt to the mix as well. Uh, Record-wise, Nunes, eight of nine wins by knockout. Baszler, 14 of 15 wins by submission, so you can certainly see where their strong suits are. Nunes, 0-1 in decisions, 1-1 in fights ended by submission, and she has uh, been knocked out twice. For Shayna Baszler, she's 1-2 in fights that go the distance, three losses by submission, and she's 0-4 in fights ended by knockout, so very finishable. For Baszler, excellent ground game. We're very well aware of what she's capable of. Uh, she trains with Josh Barnett, which isn't you know that shocking as far as her green ground capabilities. She's aggressive early when you know fighters are dry, which makes it easier to lock up an opportunity. Uh, in her last fight, she closed the distance very quickly, pushed her opponent into the cage. You know, tried to drag her to the ground. She will roll for leg locks when the opportunity presents itself. She eventually pulled co- uh, guard against Bech Kohada, established wrist control, and started working for submissions. She has a nice variety of submission opportunity or at least hold techniques. Six wins by armbar over is her big total. New training with Ronda Rousey, obviously that's something big, but of course Baszler was in the MMA game far before Rousey was even an afterthought. Two uh, twister wins as well for Baszler, so, so she can be creative. When she fought Kohada, she had her in trouble at times, just wasn't able to finish before the gas tank uh, cost her. Uh, one thing, actually a couple things I don't like about her, but the first one I don't like about her fighting style is that she tends to give up position for submission. She did score a nice takedown tr- uh, trip against Kohada, but you know, if she can't get a submission, she'll wind up on bottom, and that's something a place you don't want to be against, especially against uh, Amanda Nunes. Uh, she will work the clinch, but she wore herself out in the last fight and eventually got stopped from that position. She was coming off a long layoff, but she is known, as I like to call it, as having a one-trigger gas tank. She is able to go one hard round, and then she is spent in most scenarios. She's 2-8 and eight in fights that go beyond the first round, which is reminiscent of Roy Nelson. Uh, her gas tank cost her in the ultimate fighter. It cost her in the second fight against Alexis Davis, and it cost her against Betch Kohada in a fight that Kohada, I don't think she'd stop, scored, I don't think she had a single knockout in her career, and I called her to win by knockout because of it, and she did. Or I said at least bet on the win by knockout. Uh, Nunez, not known for having a great gas tank either, but I think it's better than Baszler. She has been finished, uh, she's a kind of finish or finished, uh, she's a finish or be finished fighter. Two and three after the first round, and two of those losses, though, against Kat Zingano and Alexis Davis, so top level opposition. She has had trouble with grapplers in the past. She's been trying to shore up her defensive issues. She got off to an exceptionally strong start against Kat Zingano, defended an early taken attempt, and put herself on top, survived an early arm bar, very strong on top, hard ground and pound. She stopped uh, Jermaine Dirondami from the position. Big shots, especially if you can posture up, she'll jump into the guard and just crack her opponent. She had Kat in a lot of trouble as a result. Uh, she likes to sit high in the guard, posture up, you know, stack opponent, generates an exceptional amount of power, and certainly bring about a stoppage with a quick barrage. Now, she did get reversed and put on her back, and that's a position she does not want to be in against Shayna Baszler, and that's uh, something we'll have to watch for here. Uh, she was also taken down in the clinch, which is where Baszler's going to try and work, but it's also a place that's going to drain Baszler, especially working with someone who's so physically strong like Nunez, that's going to make it difficult for Baszler to maintain a fight or her work pace beyond the first round. You know, Shayna can do some damage on the feet, but that's where Nunez has a clear advantage. I think Shayna's going to go for it early. She could very well get a submission win and take the fight, but I think the strain of grappling with a very strong Nunez is going to wear her out. And if, and if when Amanda gets on top, that's going to be a massive issue. Also, the heat factor in Brazil could be huge. I think Nunes, though, will eventually establish top position through one method or another and land the ground and pound. So my prediction is Amanda Nunes to defeat Shayna Baszler by TKO. Two more lightweights in our next fight as Leonardo Santos, uh, Ultimate Fighter Brazil winner with a current record 13-4-1, battles 9-2-0 Tony Martin. Both guys are submission first fighters. Martin, seven of his nine wins have come by submission. He's a BJJ purple belt. He's coming off a submission win over BJJ black belt for Mauricio Camoyes, which was Martin's first UFC win. But it's worth noting that Camoyes has been submitted twice in his career, and, sorry, three times in his career and twice in a row with Jim Miller getting him the fight prior. Uh, Martin's submission of preference. He has three wins by Kimura, plus one by Americana, so it appears he likes to attack his opponent's arms. Santos, 8 of 13 wins by submission. He's a well-versed BJJ black belt. Uh, he submitted William Macario in his debut to win the Ultimate Fighter Brazil. His submission of preference appears to be the arm triangle choke, which he defeated Macario with, and he has five overall. He also has a pretty good back mount if he can get in that position. Now, he comes from an excellent grappling camp in Nova Uniao, uh, both known for their offensive and defensive counter wrestling, which is an area he continues to improve upon. Uh, when he fought Norman Park, it was pretty good wrestling in judo. Santos shut down all eight of his takedown attempts, which is pretty noteworthy. He's not the type of guy I think he's gonna, just going to give up guard and let his opponent take top position. He will defend and work for his own opportunities. Uh, he scores takedowns from the clinch pretty effectively. He was able to take Escudero down a couple times and keep him there, and that was his you know method of victory there, his top position, uh, top position control-based decision win. 
Uh, you know, he has a good top position, ground and pound, look for submission opportunities. For Tony Martin, though, he's very aggressive when he looks for submissions. Hasn't put up great takedown numbers, picking up pretty much one takedown per fight, but he will go for submissions early and try and get that fighter out of there as soon as possible. Now, he has had issues with cardio. It, you know, in two, his two UFC defeats, it failed him after the first round. He had Rashid Magomedov in some serious trouble with a nasty tight arm bar. Now, I think he did get hurt in that fight. Uh, Martin did, but he gassed and didn't get finished, but he survived. In his next match, he still lost. In his next match against Benil Dariush, he was carrying the fight in the first round, but it gassed out and was submitted in the second frame. Did not look good. And that's, you know, not doesn't bode well for a fighter if he cannot finish, especially against a guy who's going to be very difficult to submit. For Santos, normally known for good cardio, it didn't look so good against Efren. Escudero, but against William Macario, he simply waited him out, he slowed down, he took the top position and finished that matchup. Uh, for Santos, he has improving striking. He comes from a decent striking camp as well, works the clinch very well, has nice long arms, uses that jab, decent counter strikes, and he was having success against Norman Park in a lot of the exchanges. Uh, for Martin, he, strugg he struggled in his two UFC fights. That lasted longer than a round. I keep harping on this, but I think this is going to be significant. He lost both of them, and fighting in Brazil with the heat is going to be difficult. For Santos, he should have the cardio edge, and if Martin slows down, it's gonna be, he's going to be very vulnerable against a superior grappler. Martin needs to find success early on with his feet, or with his striking and with his wrestling. I struggle to believe he'll have much success with this grappling game other than maybe controlling top position. That submission win over Fabricio Camoys was nice, but you know it's worth noting Camoys said has been tapped three times, and that's you know tells us maybe his MMA straight and grappling game isn't as good as his BJJ competition grappling. Uh, also, the edge goes to the Brazilian when he's fighting home. If this fight goes the distance, I wouldn't be surprised to see Santos pull off a submission, but my prediction is Leonardo Santos to defeat Tony Martin by decision. In the co-main event, we're with the UFC welterweights as Eric Silva, 17-5-0 with one no contest, battles Ultimate Fighter 1 alumni and former title challenger, 19-9-0 Josh Koscheck. Now Koscheck is filling in out for the injured Ben Saunders. He's gonna when this fight actually takes place, he'll have fought just 21 days prior uh, when he lost to Jake Allenberger. That was actually preceded by a 15-month layoff before that matchup, and now he's fighting on just two weeks' notice. So certainly a juxtaposition, one fight prep for the next. Now this is kind of old school Josh Koscheck. He's trying to be active again, where he fought a lot of times in a short period of time when he was younger, and he's seen you know high-profile guys like Donald Cerrone and Benson Henderson both fight on two weeks' notice and pick up victories. Now Silva. Overall, he's failed to meet his potential. He's fought and lost to top-level guys like Dong Young Kim, Matt Brown, and John Fitch, but he's able, been able to smash lower-level guys. He just cannot seem to break through that ceiling. Uh, for Koscheck, he has lost four in a row, and, but against high-level opponents. Robbie Lawler, the champ, Johnny Hendricks, the former champ, Tyrone Woodley, and Jake Ellenberg are both top-level guys in the division. Uh... This is his first time for Koscheck fighting in Brazil. That shouldn't affect him that much. As traditionally, he is the bad guy. He likes to wear that black hat in most matchups, so I don't think that's going to impact him that much. For Silva, this is his eighth time fighting in Brazil as a part of the UFC. He's four and three with that loss to Carlo Prater uh, mixed in there. So he arguably could be five and two if you want to count that as you know for what it was. Physically, Silva, two inches taller, and he'll have a one-inch reach advantage. Now, for Koscheck, he wants to get back to his wrestling. He has an excellent power double, top control, grinds guys out. He should look to utilize a similar game plan that his former teammate, John Fitch, used against Silva, who was able to break him down. Silva, 0-3 overall in fights that go beyond the first round, and Koscheck needs to be aware of this. In his fight against Ellenberg, he scored an early takedown and looked good early on. He scored two against Robbie Lawler, but he failed to hold the position, and he was forced to strike, which was his ultimate undoing. For Silva, he needs to defend the takedown. Simple enough, but not not that simple. Work his striking, stay off his back, and do damage early on when the opposition or when the opportunity presents itself. Koscheck was having success versus Jake until he got hit and was clearly impacted by the damage he took to his face, and it seemed to be minimal, but it was really throwing him off. And that goes all the way back to the George St. Pierre facial damage he suffered uh, at the jab fest that was his title shot uh, a couple of years ago. Now, Silva has good stri good striking game and packs power, but he's far from bulletproof. He leaves a lot of openings. He's very aggressive to a fault. He attempts a lot of high-risk maneuvers, which saw him co uh, cost him positionally against Fitch, and eventually got himself KO'd by Dong Young Kim. For Koscheck, he can work a decent jab. He has some power, but he really hasn't developed or flushed out... Uh, his striking repertoire, he lacks a lot of fluidity to his offense and is fairly predictable. His, ch his chin appears to be going as he was knocked out by Paul Tiago earlier in his career, but more recently by Tyrone Woodley and Robbie Lawler. Both guys hit like trucks, though. 
Uh, he's also been submitted twice. His last fight against Jake Ellenberger, most noteworthy. Uh, for Silva, he's a black belt in BJJ and in judo, and he's 10-0 in fights ended by submission. That's something to keep aware of as well. If Kostya can find success with his wrestling and be consistent, he could wear him down. But Silva, you know, he's going to land something, and I think it's going to keep Kostya from really focusing. He's going to put him off his game. And the thing is, he took some damage against Jake Ellenberger. In a couple weeks, will he physically have recovered from that damage, or will it be the type of thing where Silva lands a couple shots and it starts to bother him, throw him off, and, you know, prevent him from fighting his game? The short camp, fighting in Brazil, the age, it's all tough for Josh Koscheck. I think it's valiant of him to try and take a last hurrah. If you pick up a win, good for him. But I'm going to go with my head here and my prediction is Eric Silva to defeat Josh Koscheck. I'll take Silva by TKO. Our final fight of the night takes place also in the UFC's welterweight division is the number 7th ranked former middleweight title challenger Damian Maia, 19-6-0. Battles the number 15th ranked undefeated 11-0 Ryan LaFleur. Now these are fighters that temporarily or at least right now are headed in opposite directions. Maia is number 7, uh, LaFleur number 15. Maia is trying to hold on to relevancy in the division and avoid sliding further. LaFleur is still climbing the ladder and certainly got into the rankings and looking to make a big name for himself. For Maya, he started exceptionally strong at wealth rate, but has lost two in a row against elite level competition. And then he's slipping, you know, he picked up a win in his last fight, but certainly against a lower level opponent. For LaFleur, he's been slowly picking up wins that have been increasing in significance and value. Most recently beating John Howard, the fight before that beating Court McGee. So some nice names, but nothing of massive significance. Maya, he's faced overall better competition than his opponent. And more importantly, he has a big, not more importantly, but still another something worth noting, 25 to 11 in total fight experience. He has a lot more experience in his opposition. Both guys are ground-based fighters. Maya, 4-3 BJJ black belt. LaFleur, BJJ purple belt. LaFleur, wrestling-wise, 4.75 takedowns at 59%. Uh, sorry, so Ryan LaFleur, 4.75 takedowns at 59% completion rate, 40% defensive takedown uh, numbers. Maya, 2.98 takedowns at a 30% completion rate, 67% takedown defense. So what did all that mean? Looks like LaFleur... You know, does a better job landing takedowns. Maya, slightly better job defending takedowns. Uh, Damian Maya, nine wins by submission in his career, six in the UFC. Only one, though, in his last 14, which was by Rick Story. In his second fight at Welterweight, was that nasty neck crank that made Rick Story's nose blowed, up, blowed, bleed. My apologies, I'm a little bit sick, so trying to overcome this. Either way, he's reaffirmed his commitment to grappling and certainly had to his benefit. Uh, we'll see if it pans out here. LaFleur, four decisions in all four of his UFC fights, and he scored 19 takedowns. Uh, in his three, pre uh, three previous submission wins outside of the octagon, all came by armbar. Now, keep in mind, LaFleur has been taken down five times in his last two matchups, four by Court McGee and one by John Howard, and he had some issues with Howard trying to take him down and grapple with him. So certainly the question is, how can he fare against a guy who's so much better than those guys, you know, a top-level grappler like Damian Maya. The big question as well, could the grappling cancel each other out and force these guys to, guys to rely on their striking? Probably not. I, they're, obviously, they're going to show some striking, but I think both guys will try and do what they're best at. LaFleur has been so successful with his grappling. We haven't seen a ton of his striking. He works well from the clinch, uh, but he, for the most part, is centered on setting up his takedowns and taking his fighter, closing that distance. For Maya... His striking has been improving, but it's kind of stagnated of late. He likes to keep things simple but effective. Jab, straight right, work the low kicks. He might go to the body or the head. He's never knocked anybody out, but we did see him drop uh, or hurt. Mark Munoz at one point gave him that stank leg. And then we also saw him drop, drop Alexander Yakolev in his last matchup, but he was unable to finish. Uh, cardio is going to be a big factor in this fight. Neither guy has fantastic cardio. Maya seems to slow down a little bit quicker than LaFleur. Against Rory McDonald, who's an elite-level guy, Maya gassed horribly after dominating the first round. Wasn't able to finish. Uh, the third round, he had some opportunities to control the position and couldn't do it simply because he was so tired. The numbers would suggest something similar. He's 7-5 and five in fights that go to decision, 3-5 and five in his last eight fights to go beyond the first round. But he is 2-2 two and two at welterweight, which tells us, you know, he does have uh, some capabilities as far as uh, dealing with the smaller guys and grinding fights out. He's had mixed results against very good grapplers, dominating John Fitch on the mat and getting beaten by Jake Shields. And, you know, don't knock that Jake Shields loss. Everybody seems to undervalue Jake because he's not a flashy or exciting fighter, but he's a very capable ground fighter. And, you know, as much as Damian Maia would like to tout himself as the best grappler around, Jake Shields really showed what he's capable of in that matchup. Now, that's a big step up for Ryan LaFleur is he hasn't faced anyone at this level, especially when it comes to skill on the mat. And he said he had some issues with his past opponents in the grappling department that Damian Maia certainly could exploit. I don't think LaFleur's going to like being put on his back here. I was impressed with Maya's hips when he fought Jake Shields, especially initially. He was able to defend some of those takedowns. And I don't think LaFleur is quite at the Jake Shields level. 
I don't think the cardio for LeFleur, as much as Maya's going to slow down, I don't think LeFleur will be able to do that much later in the fight, because I think he'll slow down as well. This is his first five-round fight for Maya. I think this is his third in his career that could very well go five rounds. I think Maya's going to be able to get ahead early on, and I don't think he's going to give up that much later in the matchup that gets LeFleur back into it. I think Maya's actually going to have some decent success with his striking. I think he'll defend the takedowns. He'll score some of his own, put LeFleur in some positions he doesn't like. And, of course, there's always that... Uh, Brazilian home factor where LaFleur could be in over his head a little bit. I think he's fought once in Brazil already, though. Uh, either way, a submission is possible, but I'm going to go with Damian Maia, who on some cards is the underdog, and some car some bet sites he is the favorite. Either way, my prediction is Damian Maia to defeat Ryan LaFleur by decision. So those are my predictions for UFC Fight Night 62. I apologize. I spoke very quickly and rushed a little bit because it was my second time recording and I want to get things on the road, get this video rendering. Either way, all my preliminary breakdowns will be available at kamikazeoverdrive.net. Um, also, the bet packs will be posted and for 10 bucks. I'll certainly consider investing because odds are I've been making money a lot recently and I've had success the last couple of Brazilian cards. I intend to do so as here, here as well with a more conservative but still profitable approach. And I will always have a big money maker here or there put in there You know, if you want to go huge. Uh, also, DraftKings, I'm challenging you. I did terrible. Everybody beat me but one person in the last show. I intend to do better this time around. I'm challenging you to sign up, come out, let me know what your name is. As you know, Send me an email, let me know what your uh, username is so you can, I can tell if you beat me or not. Either way, the, the last two winners have both been members of my website. Uh, so certainly I'm picking the right guys to dominate those shows and write predictions for me. And uh, we'll see if we can keep it in the family or if you can take home the 180 bucks. I believe it'll be. Uh, just click on one of the banners and follow the instructions. I'm, I have struggled my entire prediction podcast career to come up with a flashy way to end the show. So uh, some catchy line to uh, say see you later. But uh, I still don't have one. Thanks for listening, guys. Talk to you later.